call the meeting to order and uh, see if we can uh, have an acceptance of the agenda for this evening. Uh, motion, we accept the agenda. Second motion. Okay, accept it. I apologize for the situation. We seem to have not have a key for the right closet to get the tables out, so we're going to have to play campfire and do what we can do here. My key no longer fits, so I don't know if they're trying to tell me something. <laughs> okay, I'd like to uh, have a motion to accept the uh, July meeting minutes. And your motion? Motion to accept the second. Sorry. Okay, uh, I just have a couple of things I'd like to say. Uh, Oh, Kelly Rogers, a little bit of the confusion. Kelly Rogers is uh, no longer going to be um, our recording secretary. Jane Frank is Temporary. volunteered temporarily. <laughs> thank you. Appreciate it very much. Um, I attended an easement meeting in Hamarok this past week uh, where they were talking about the uh, the dredge spoils and building a dune on the uh, on the ocean side of Hamrock to uh, try and protect it. And uh, kind of hard to read. There was a, a really mixed feeling about whether it should be done or not. Don Horahan was down there. Don, do you have anything you want to add as far as how the people felt about it? Nothing. <laughs> okay. <laughs> it, was, it was. I mixed. agree. <laughs> it was very. It was very was, mixed. There wasn't a lot of support. A lot of support at all. Um, Brian Kelly is out of the country. Um, he was going to give us a report on our last meeting with Jack Wigan from UMass. Came down and talked to us about our harbor study plan and about updating it. Uh, we will be working on it. We're going to take it up on our next meeting when uh, Brian is back. Um, We'll start with the um, Harbor Master Report, Stephen. Well, uh, the last meeting I was not here. I was at uh, the Selectman's, um, a Selectman meeting. And the reason I was at the Selectman meeting was we hired an engineer for the coal, piling, coal marina piling project. Um, they approved the, uh, the hiring of the um, consultant and the cost of the consultant was $102,044. Um, he, we felt very, um, it wasn't based on price alone, although he did have the best price. Um, we, he's also doing a very similar project in Howard with the similar uh, issues that we have here. Um, you know, dealing with Mass DEP and a uh, federal mooring, federal anchorage. Uh, so we felt very confident uh, with all his answers. So we, um, we put it to the selectmen and they approved it. Uh, pilot, the pilot project is moving along um, at a very good pace right now. Uh, he's been out to review the site. Uh, I believe he's been here four or five times, met with myself and Paul Scott. Um, also, he's hired the electrical engineer for the Cold Parkway pilot project because you do need an electrical engineer because some of the conductors will be moved. I have also hired uh, him to review the electrical system both here and over at Cole Parkway in regards to GFCI protection and uh, shunt trip breakers to shut the systems down. Uh, we do, uh, I met with him. Um, Paul Scott was also there. Uh, we felt very comfortable with him. He's going to do a good job, and we didn't want to have basically conflicting answers from engineers. So we chose him. Uh, that was a cost of $4,900 to for the review. Uh, after that, uh, we have assigned uh, over 80 moorings this season. Uh, Mike Bierce is doing a great job. He is very time consuming. Uh, but he is, some mornings have been turned in, so we are now in the process of assigning those as well. Um, each year there's about 20 mornings that are turned over. So he's in the process of getting those out and assigned. Um, aside of that, we've had a relatively good summer out on the waterways. We've had a couple of issues earlier this year in 
June, uh, the Situa police called us to have us run down to the spit uh, with one of our patrol boats. They had a lot of kids down there and um, there was, some, I guess, some drinking going on and they wanted to make sure that none of the boats that were on the spit left. Um, unit two was dispatched with two of my assistants. They were already out on the water. They went down and they kind of kept them in. There were two boats that they had to escort over to um, Marshfield, where Marshfield Fire Rescue met them, and they were checked out. Um, also, uh, later on, that was at around four o'clock and about five, that's when they started to take off. I, myself, got underway in unit one, and I was headed to the spit, and I come, came across another boat that was uh, overloaded. Uh, it had, I believe, 11 people on board. I stopped them for a safety inspection. I determined that the operator was not under the influence. I escorted them back into the harbor where it was met with Situa police and turned them over to the police at that point. Uh, everything went very well. Um, I believe there was one person that was taken to the hospital from Marshfield and there was one person taken to the hospital from here. Um, other than that, we had a, a boat taking on water at the spit a few weeks ago. Um, my staff went, was out on patrol again. They went down. Uh, they were getting, you know, they had me on the phone. They were getting ready to uh, figure out how they're going to get to this person because of the surf and the, the conditions that were going on. I asked them to hold until uh, Coast Guard was en route. They got there. Um, Citroën PD showed up short, shortly thereafter. Uh, one of my guys went into the water and Unit 2 had one of the Coast Guard uh, guardsmen on board our boat, so when they pulled the woman out of the water, they had the extra hands they needed to get that person out of the water. And then my uh, assistants turned, them over, turned the woman over to uh, MP1, mm -hmm. took her to mm -hmm. over to Marshfield, I believe, and then my mm -hmm. staff went and retrieved the boat to the Coast Guard. Mm -hmm. Other than that, it's been a relatively Decent summer. Uh, we've had a couple other toes here and there, and you know, but it's been a good summer all in all. Everything's gone very well. Um, so got the, the moorings. The, uh, oh, we we did do we did install the uh, shed turf breaker over at Cole Parkway Marina. Um, that is a one button shutdown system. <coughs> We actually used it about three weeks later because we had uh, a conductor that shorted. So I went out and shut the system down, had the electrician come in, make the repairs, and we turned the system back on. So it worked just the way it was supposed to. And we we're planning on making improvements to that system uh, going forward as well with the GFCI protection. Also, we but uh, with the new mooring rules and regulations that were rolled out, uh, we have collected all of our mooring fees. Usually we're collecting them in March, I mean in uh, November and December for the previous season. So they've all been collected. We revoked one mooring due to the lack of payment. Uh, we're in the process of collecting all the documents required. Um, and we're going to an online system to make people aware of what we're, what we're expecting of them in regards to payments, documentation, what's going on at Marina, and the weather, so on. Questions? Yeah. Uh, two questions. Did the, does the cost of the consulting is that within the framework of what you were allocated yes. for the project? Yes, that was all part of it, yeah. We had to have a consultant to uh, handle all the licensing. Right. And my second question was, at one point you were going to uh, tag uh, all the morals. They've all been banded, yes. Yeah. <coughs> 
Peter. Uh, were all the eating warrants that were signed uh, done in accordance with the revised mooring regulations? They were. I turned it over to Mike Pierce and uh, I put him in charge of that project. Yeah, a lot of time and effort went into that, so that's great to hear. Yeah, so I had one person do it. It was methodical, you know, it was done by the members. Phyllis. Um, thank you. Um, I have a couple of questions. Steve, do you hire personally all of the assistant harbor masters and your crew that you have working for you? I interview them. Uh, then they go to Stephen Salk, and then the town administrator uh, hires the assistants. Okay. I have, I have a little bit of a problem, I guess, with the depth of the knowledge of some of the people that are working on your team. Um, last summer, there was a boat in the harbor that was sinking. Um, two harbor masters were out there with a couple of pumps, couldn't keep up with the thing until one of the girls driving the launch comes by and says, gee, did you close the Seacocks? No, you know, kind of a thing. I mean, how is it that um, your crew maybe doesn't know the depth of boating that is necessary for some of the daily things that go on? <coughs> then, again, there was a boat that was sinking in the harbor, and I went down and I asked them the other day, what time was the last run that you guys made last night? Or the first one. Or when was the, when was one of the harbor master boats out this past night? Finally, got an answer, and I said, "Would you know if a boat was not sitting on its waterline?" And they said, "Well, no, we wouldn't keep tabs on anything like that. It's dark, and maybe we wouldn't see something like that." So I said, "Well, actually, if you were going out of the harbor, you know, from the coast, the harbor master's office to the outer harbor." You would go by this boat every time you went by there, okay? And they could not pick up the fact that this boat basically sunk. Everything was underwater. And I, so to me, this is basic training. I don't understand why even the little kids, I mean, you guys are the eyes of the harbor. This, it should be, and I, one of the kids said, well, we'd see if the bow were up. And I said, it should never get to that point. I mean, we pay $125 extra for the last couple of years in waterways user fees. I mean, what are we getting for our money when it comes to this kind of stuff? Because clearly, the eyes of the harbor are not what I would be expecting for the team that's supposed to be keeping control of the harbor. And um, but the next, which leads into the fact that this week, um, after Labor Day and next week are typically high vandalism to boats within the harbor. Is there extra patrol, patrols on for anything like that? But in the past, these are the two weeks that we usually see a higher incidence of vandalism. Well, it's 7.30 now. I have three people that are out on Unit 3 right now. I just spoke with them. Okay. Um, the, Did they go out in the middle of the night? They're out there now. If you look outside of Situat Harbor, I believe they're on their way down to the North River because there's more than just Situat Harbor. We have the North River, South River. Last weekend, we had a boat in distress that we were towing back. I believe it was on last Sunday night um, because I had a friend of mine, it was either Sunday or Monday night that we were towing back and he was actually staying at the uh, Air Force Reservation and he sent me a picture of it and said, what's up? And I called the office and it was a boat in distress that we were towing back to the harbor. So we are out there all the time. Personally, last week I was walking the docks here and there was a boat that the water line was low. So I went and checked and there was water in the bilge. We got a dewatering pump and we pumped it up, contacted the owner, told them that they should check on their boat themselves as well. Uh, today we went out and we walked up and down the docks and we were out in the harbor checking boats because of the weather that we had today. So we are out there. Okay. We do check boats. There is probably 2,000 boats that are in the harbor. I'm, I'm it, it's difficult to check every, it, it, it's, but it's difficult to check every single one and look at every wall line. But we do look at boats every day to make sure that they are floating. And it is also up to the owner as well to make sure that their boat is floating as well. So it, 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 
it's more than just our fault. Oh, I know. I, I, I realize that. But my, so, my younger so staff? It's the, the eyes of the harbor. Yep. And I, I just think that we need to you know, make sure that the people that are working on our payroll as taxpayers and as voters within the community, that they are seeing the things that need to be seen, especially when they're right in front of us. I, had, I have six maritime cadets that worked with me this summer. They're still working through the season. Uh, Mike Bierce is out there. I'm out there. Um, I have um, fire department personnel, retired police officers, uh, and they're all boaters. Okay. So we, we are looking for this stuff. Well, Mike Bierce and I went out last spring and we found a boat that was sinking. <clears throat> it happens. You can, have, you can lose a boat in minutes. It doesn't take hours or days. It can take minutes. If a sea cock lets go, it's going down right away. And you're probably not going to stop it. No. Short of climbing aboard and getting yourself in, you could pot potentially put yourself in a very dangerous situation by going below decks. Well, fortunately for this first incident, you know, somebody did go down and close the sea class and prevented the boat from completely going mm -hmm. down. So then let me specifically ask, <coughs> the, the hours mm -hmm. between 11 o'clock at night and 5 o'clock in the morning, do you make any runs out through the harbor? We're, we close at midnight and we open at 8 a.m. Okay, that answers that question. So you're not controlling We are not there between Years ago, I believe they had security, and that was cut out of the budget. Could, from security what I and patrol. Yeah, security and patrol. Mm -hmm. These gentlemen actually used to work here long before I did. I, I believe uh, on in the late, I, 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 we were both assistant harbor masters in the late 80s, early 90s, and I believe that the 24-hour patrols ended. I used to be the overnight 2 a.m. to 10 a.m., and I believe that that ended 20 Years ago. Uh, I don't know if it was 20, but it was quite a few years ago that that ended. Long before Steve got here. Um, I just want to make a couple real quick questions about uh, comments about boat sinking. We had a boat sink at my marina on the driftway, and we had staff till 7 p.m. They went out, the boat was fine. An hour later, we got a call from uh, another boater. Um, we recovered the boat, but it, it sank to the bottom. They can, it can happen uh, immensely fast. Um, Steve was uh, having a meeting with me over my marina last week and we had uh, a gentleman come, his son came and he was in distress and Steve uh, in the midst of having a meeting, him and I went out and we uh, <coughs> helped this boater. So I mean, he's trying to do the best that he can. The problem is that there's no, it's very hard to match up the timeline when a crisis happens to having somebody stand there and be right on top of it. I, I do, I understand, believe me, I've voted in this harbor for as long as you guys have, at least, if not more. But still, I, I, if I can't inundate the, the, the harbor patrol is the eyes of the harbor. And I hope that you'll reinforce that. Thank you. Thank you for making a quick Peter. comment. Yeah. Go ahead, if you don't mind. Yeah, I was going to say that the uh, the staff this year seems. I was going to say they've seemed a lot better, a lot more yeah. approachable. The guys have been very professional. I've dealt with a lot of them this year, and I'd say that this year, much better upgraded staff. I know some of them have carried over, but as far as comms and the radio and politeness to people and the public and more inviting, um, I give you a thumbs up for that. It's been much better. Yeah, us usability. I think that they're yeah. Yeah. Definitely. Yeah. Thank you. I, I, don't, I If I can interrupt here, we have a couple of guests here tonight. I don't know what their constraints are on time. So uh, we have the Citra Police, um, Chief Mike Stewart and Brenda McCauley. Um, I'm sorry. Are you waving at me for a Go ahead. I, I, just, I just don't want to hold these guys up, that's all. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, Pete Toppin, 26 Clack Road, all right? Former member of WWC. This meeting, when people stand, to speak, they need to identify themselves so that the secretary has complete and accurate records. Thank you. Thank you, Peter. Tim Montgomery. <clears throat> Tim Montgomery, I have to do a little Just an informational question. I understand that the moorings may be renumbered, 
My question is, when will that be done? How will the memorandum permit holders find out what their new warrant numbers are so we can put the right uh, identification on the forms? Um, we're in the process, we went out and banded to get an accounting of the moorings that are out there. Uh, we're trying to match them up with actual moorings to make sure that those are all actual moorings that we went out to ban. Uh, it'll probably be next year before we go out to renumber and you'll be notified. Thank you. Okay. Any, any, yeah. any other questions? I'll, I'll defer my question okay. until after. Chief Stewart? Yeah, thank you. Floor is yours. <coughs> I want to introduce Brenda McCauley and Deputy Chief Mark Thompson. Uh, I got to let them each do a little preview of what we've been doing this year. But to, uh, to some of uh, Phil's point, the, and she guys, the harbor used to be patrolled all night while the weather was good, and sometimes beyond that, when Elma Bula. If he just thought it was a decent storm, the Nor'easter blowing up, he'd go out and check things at night. Uh, you know, unfortunately now, we don't have the ability to do it. I know Steve doesn't have this, his budget. I have three or four guys working at night, so, you know, we could put the boat out in an emergency. But other than that, we're not really fit to do it. Uh, I do think that back when there was an overnight patrol, that we were very successful, as it, you know, it was a huge deterrent. Uh, there's a lot of things that can happen on those boats overnight out in the house that none of us are going to see. And, you know, we've been pretty lucky, I think, over the years that we haven't had any major losses or, or damage done, but you're absolutely right, it, it could happen. Uh, the Officer McCauley this year was put in charge of the Marine Unit, and uh, he's done a great job with it. He works under the immediate control of the deputy who's in charge of special operations for the power. Uh, any any program as we anticipated with this was going to take two or three years to get it up and running. Uh, we decided when we first uh, were tasked with doing this that if we're going to do it, we got to do it right. And to do that right, it means training. And while some of these guys said, uh, you know, we're assistant hot masters, and uh, one of the guys was a captain on a fishing boat and things like that. It's different when you run the police boat. Uh, so these guys had extensive training with the environmental police. Environmental police were awesome. They put on uh, and then uh, we went out and did all sorts of different situations out off the harbor. Uh, the Coast Guard was actively involved. I know Steve crew was involved at, at times and uh, that, you need to do that. I, I would no sooner turn around and take a kid 20, 21 years old, and put him in a cruiser and say, yeah, that's how you turn on the lights, go have fun. There's way too much liability attached to it, way too much. And, you know, you know I, it, sometimes I think the kids are great. The guys that you had this year, I got a compliment. The job that they did down in the spit with that boat that you're talking about, uh, they'd never been put in a situation like that. And on top of it, you had a, a woman who didn't want to leave the boat. <coughs> And she's sitting there punching and kicking the assistant out. So uh, those are situations that you know I'd like to see training for. Deeper. And as we'll discuss, uh, discuss with some of the guys, in order to be a special police officer in the city, you have to go through 400 hours of training. Once you're done with that 400 hours, you don't get a police car and a, a badge and a gun and go running out. You got months of field training. And we have field training officers until they sign up on it, they're not going anywhere alone. And if you don't hold up your end of it, then you're going to be released. Not everybody makes it. So I think, uh, you know, I would definitely like to see more training. The problem is with the have a masters, I don't know what the assistants get paid, but $15 an hour. Some of the, the kids, you know, 13 to. 13, 13 to 16 dollars. My son's special started around 18, but they go and get this 400 hours of training, which is over 1,500 dollars to get it on their own. Then they go and buy their uniforms on their own. They buy everything on their own because they want that job. And you know, 13 dollars an hour. I think you're putting that burden back on the parents to supply the kids that stuff if that's the route they want to go. But you know, I think. Uh, one way or another, 
uh, whether it's your staff or my staff, we should have some patrol during the course of the, the overnights. I think that just makes too much sense to not try to do it. If that means going back to the Board of Selectmen and trying to get that budget in, we should do it. So, and that's articulate the needs for it. And, you know, having eyes and ears on that half 24 7 is nothing but a good idea. So, I'd like uh, Officer McCauley to explain some of the additional training that they've done uh, in some of the other programs that we have. So, we handed out uh, to the members of the board and anybody in the office here. So it, uh, it outlines some of the training on the first page that we've, we've done. It, uh, it outlines also on the next few pages some of the incidents just over the last month uh, that we've been involved in while out of the water. So uh, like the Chief mentioned, we're in our third year of this program. Every year we're getting a little bit better. Uh, the, the, it's not like driving a car. It's, uh, I mean, you, you folks in the room are boaters, you understand that there's, there's a lot of information and a, a lot of things that you need to know to vote. So we're taking police officers that have some voting experience, um, and then, but a lot of police experience. So that side, they're good, they're strong. You know, officers, the cable officers, no, what they're operating by. So also, uh, recreational voting versus uh, law enforcement voting, two different complete animals. So a lot more information you need, a lot more training you need to, to adequately, adequately perform your mission while you're out there. So each year, Training. This year we uh, we had a very rigorous training and selection process for the unit, which is outlined on the uh, the first page here. Uh, written exam that people had to pass, uh, and then there was hands-on practical uh, tests that needed to be done. Also, uh, we brought in a third-party company. Uh, we didn't just self-certify anybody in the unit. It was all done by a third party that we brought in hired to do this. Uh, maritime tactical trainers. So the officers got that, and then in conjunction, once they successfully completed, completed all those, then we started doing uh, underway training with the Mass Environmental Police, the United States Coast Guard, Marshall, Lava Master, Quincy Police, uh, just to kind of hone our skills even more and constantly be trained. So uh, recently, I don't know if you want to talk about Metro, you want me to yeah. So recently, the deputy will speak further on it. Uh, Recently, we joined a, uh, a regional collaborative uh, with a special response unit for the maritime environment. It, it includes uh, marine patrols on boats, and then it also includes a scuba uh, component also. Uh, so another layer of training, higher level of training uh, for the guys that are underway uh, out there. So each year, we do more training. These guys are getting better and better. Uh, the, group, the group guys and girls that we have on the team uh, top notch. I mean, they're great police officers, number one, and number two, they're starting to be great maritime officers over the last couple of years, too. So, I'll let you talk some more. Maybe Metro piece of it. Sure. Um, so, as, as both the, the chief and officer from my colleague said, this has really been kind of an escalation of what we're building each year. So, we're now into our third year. So, we knew year one going into this that it wasn't just going to be turnkey. We we're going to have to learn some things and we're going to you know, crawl before we ran. So, year one, we crawled. In year two, we were running, we started to jog, and I think this year we're starting to really hit our paces. Um, that's really come to fruition now with Metro. Uh, so this Metropolitan Law Enforcement Council, people haven't heard of it. Uh, there are over 45 communities, basically south of Boston, and uh, in kind of in and around Boston, that have got together in consortium. So really, it's, it's an understanding that local municipalities don't every day see and have to react to the same type of things that Boston has for some bigger cities. Uh, but by the same tokens, they do happen. So just in Medway tonight, there was a call out of barricade subject, swap thing, and pull deal. There was one in a couple of weeks ago. Wait a minute. The communities happen, and this issue is going to happen too. And it has happened. So the idea is that these communities work together. They train individual officers within their departments. And then when an incident comes up, you have local people who are familiar with the areas the surrounding the community who come together with a much higher level of training skill set, tools that they can bring to the job, and that can quickly respond. Um, so Metro really does that. As Officer Polly alluded to, SWAT is one of the components. Uh, there's a search and rescue component that goes to a computer crimes. Um, and this year, they're now working on spinning up a marine dive unit. Um, so it's online kind of the, uh, the handout that we had here, but it really looks at when you look at it from Boston down to Plymouth and beyond, there's an incredible amount of water that's being covered by these different communities. Uh, whether that water is on the ocean or that's going in into lakes, rivers, streams, whatever. Uh, so, so these units of different expertise that each of these communities has to offer, when they come together, and, and as everyone here I think knows, when there's an incident out in the water, it's not necessarily just going to be the situation that's going to respond. 
It will be Marshfield, Darksbury, Hingham, whoever, depending on the size of the incident. We're going to bring in mutual aid resources to do that. So this allows all those units to train together, get on a similar operating picture, so that when an incident does happen, they can work seamlessly together because they've already practiced, they've already rehearsed. Um, I think this officer will probably also do it too now. The, the officers that are involved in this unit, um, the level of expertise that they bring from the policing side and the specialties that they bring, whether they're detectives, whether they're already involved in the squad, whether they're guide trainers, um, they bring a lot of expertise that they have. So when they're on our boat and going out there, it's not just the capabilities that they have from a maritime environment to bring all those other things as well. Um, so that for us is really, I think, uh, is, a, is a huge thing. Um, in dive, I think one of the other things that's really being rec recognized now is the difference between the rescue and recovery. So as soon as something happens in the water, and it's a determination made that that person that's in the water or persons that are in the water are not necessarily viable anymore, it's just from a rescue to recovery. As soon as that shift has happened, it's no longer rescue, it's now a law enforcement function. There's crime scene, there's evidence, there's concerns that have to go along with that. So the divers that we have that uh, we're now training with in the Spars and Metro, they bring this huge skill set. Uh, we're very fortunate to be working with Posey. Uh, it's really nationally recognized as a, as a leader in the dive environment. So uh, it's, it's a great thing for, uh, for our community and for the officers that are involved here so that they can continue to build upon what they already have. Who questions? Did you guys talk about diving? I asked this to Steve also. Do you guys carry diving equipment on the boat with you? No. No? No. So, yeah, we have our gear back at the station. It's all set to go. Um, we have a couple of divers that train with the fire department as well within this unit. Um, and if there's a specific call out, they'll get geared up and you can get out onto the water. Uh, specifically set so too, because we don't exactly know what the dive environment is going to be. Uh, so if it wasn't necessarily on the boat, it might be a different environment that we can help you from station and floor somewhere else. Uh, my name is Jerry Ramos. I'm ex Coast Guard, Coast Guard Auxiliary. I've been a professional mariner for the last 30 years. I've held a 69 time master's license. And I guess in the last two weeks, there was an incident where you guys and the Coast Guard were racing out of this harbor. The Coast Guard told you guys to stand up. One of the problems was your vessel throws a four-foot wake. <coughs> Who told you the Coast Guard told us to stand up? I don't remember that. That's what I heard. Anyway, your vessel throws a big wake. You're responsible for any damage that causes you to realize that? Yeah, I was really aware of that. So. Yeah. Yeah, that our vessel, I don't believe a four-foot wake takes a little bit of extreme. The Coast Guard boat doesn't. I would say on plane, I boat doesn't throw that, that much. And that officers are trained not to, to attempt to come I, up. On. I had people tell me it was everything around it was other boats were just rocking. So we're, we're our officers, and I mean, there's, there's a, a few different law enforcement vessels that all leave from the same range. I know. The Harbor so, Master's boat, the same thing. They go all in out of this harbor. They, so the, the new boat they have doesn't throw that way. So our officers are, are trained to not attempts to gain momentum or speed until past the town pier. So there's a moving water there that gives them the boat the ability to get up on plane to throw a minimal amount of weight to leave the harbor. There's instances when time is of the essence and we need to go out. I can tell you, I wasn't on the boat, I, we have never been told to stay down by the Coast Guard. So I'm not sure if no such point. So I, yeah. They're they following us and telling us to respond when they get called the lunch Well, I'm in direct contact with the Cox and the two brokers. Yeah. That's the difference. Uh, with both cautions. Anytime that they deploy or we deploy, I talk to them on the phone. Yeah. So they wouldn't have so, um, In your training, you guys don't hold any sort of Coast Guard license. The Coast Guard license, I'm oh, sorry. So what is your training as far as rules on the road, radar navigation? Sure. That's all it's all yeah. all built into our training program. So you don't you don't necessarily need a Coast Guard uh, captain's license to operate an emergency response system. There's two different there's yeah. similarities and there's two, two different things there. So, yeah. so the focus is, is is primarily on municipal law enforcement uh, vessel operations. So but you're operating on the water. Yes. There are federal navigation regulations. Oh, absolutely. We're, we all we all have our boating safety course. We took the regular course, regular boating safety course, and then moving forward, 
on like the exam that the office of sort this year it had rules of the road, age and navigation, uh, latitude, longitude, all that stuff. So that's with radar? Yeah, we have, I mean, it's, that's a lot of on the road training. They do all that, but we're, we, we train uh, on the systems that are on our platform. And now uh, with Metro, they're trained on multiple platforms. What I've asked you to do is be an ex coast guy that go talk to these guys now. Yeah. See what they I think that's all you I heard that. Just, we, we, I, just, I actually had an incident when I was living in California where a uh, Navy ship was going through San Pablo Bay. I said, oh, it was anchored on the beach. Yeah. And it went through, through a big wave. Well, there's going to be a lot of misinformation. When, yeah. when I got back to my boat, everything inside it was. I got the owner of which way. I kept holding the Coast Guard. Well, playing with them. And then went and talked to them. And they said, yeah, I can you know, file a lawsuit, but it's an aid to go into court. Well, anytime this, you know, if you need information clarified, by all means, call me, call me, call me, call me, call me, I'd rather have the right information out there than the wrong information. And I know some wrong information is out there. But just to wrap up, this, you know, it's a work in progress. We're not perfect right now. Uh, we're just going to keep striving towards that and do whatever we can. This committee, uh, anybody else have suggestions that can help us? We're all these. Yes, ma'am. Can I just say, it's Bullis Carl Burke, 26 years old. Um, why is it not possible for you guys to double up? Power master and police aboard one boat. Not saying they couldn't have, but they can have that same training as us. Well. Right now we haven't trained. So there's no sense having one of our guys on a boat that does something a certain way and having another person on the boat that has no idea what he's doing. You know, we put two people on that boat. Uh, one's the operator, one's the first mate, and they work together. And until that happens, um, you know. but, I, but I agree. And is, is that a possibility down the road? Absolutely. So, but I think the coordination of training has to take place. That's never a bad thing. You can't train that. And manning that boat, do you have two or three on there? Two. Two. Yeah, you need two to leave the Try to do mostly daytime, but uh, during the weeks, weekends, and Wednesday nights, because of the sailboat races, they try to get out at night. If during the course of the morning it's not a good boat day, I'm not going to boat. I'll try to use those guys to do something else. So, uh, but I try to get it out eight hours, eight hours a day. However, sometimes that's broken up into two four-hour shifts, and the other thing is, we don't have, we have limited operators. And if I, there's not a certified competent operator, the boat's not getting done. Um, do you have any idea how many calls you've had from year one and year two and year three? I can get that information, but I don't have it. I'll talk about it by any means. The season's not over. Okay. I'd be interested just to see if it's grown or if it's, you know, how it's progressed over the, the three years. I probably guess that it's gone up a little bit, but part of that is communicating with the Harbor Master on the Coast Guard and getting involved. Thank you. Howie. Yeah, I just want to follow up on Phyllis's comment because I'm going to listen to what you have to say. It's really important. I'm asking myself that the ends justify the means. I hear a lot of redundancy. Are you hearing about the Harbor master has the capacity and four or five boats that can be manned without new certain things. And can enforce certain regulations on the water. I'm hearing about guide teams, and we have the Super Fire Department, which has a trained guide team. Rescue team. And your, and your equipment's at, at the station. And we've got the Coast Guard out there supervising what goes on in maritime instances. 
It's not simply asking, does the recipient justify the means and the cost? Why do we have to have silos? Why would we consider, to your point about cooperative training, why don't we get together and get a bigger bang for it? Some of it's, yeah, I mean, you got to compare apples and apples. Fire department is a rescue team. They die too. Rescue that. Once that becomes a recovery, yeah. it's a district attorney's police operation. Okay. They're not evidence collectors. So you have to go back to the station to get your equipment back. Unfortunately, generally when that happens, there's not a big rush. I, I, I'm not here to tell you how to do your job. Yeah. That's what you do. I'm simply, as a concerned person, a voter, a licensed captain, taking a step back. And I'm concerned about expense and equipment. We're <clears throat> double teaming, which might not be a bad thing if you get a bigger bang for your buck. But it sounds a little disjointed to me. That's, that's what I'm telling you. We're, we're trying to fill a void that was obvious to pretty much everybody over the last several decades that there was no law enforcement on the law. Isn't that by definition a harbor master? No. It's not. No, well, it's I not. Mean, Steve being an exception here, okay, because uh, before that, that wouldn't happen. How can it be law enforcement if they don't even have citation books? Well, that's I mean, just. I, I, hear you, I hear that's a different story. The point is, by law, I think the harbor master has certain responsibilities and regulatory powers. Yeah, he's a special no. police officer on the right. police chief. Now, whether he has three months look, that's, that's another thing. You maybe you should be talking about why you didn't have that. But again, this is not my forte. I'm simply giving you a snapshot of what I'm hearing and just want to make some comments about it. I, I'm saying why that's how we, I kind of agree. It seems to be a lot of redundancy. Got the DEP, we've got the Coast Guard, we've got the MP1, and we've got the Harbor Masters. I understand you all have different functions, but now this Metropolitan Council, are they the ones who fund your operation? Or this, like the recovery team? And, um, where does does the, like? Where does the funding come from for your operation? That comes from the department. Okay. Yep. So as it grows, you figure they it should be funded with no problem? Yeah, we fund the guys, we have two guys trained in SWAT. Right. We have two guys who have completed the interviews and the training for, to be operators on the, uh, the Marine piece of it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that comes from us. So you're able to use the special operations guys to kind of move back and forth? And they share from town to town. Yeah. Yeah. So other towns will do the same thing they're doing if there's an incident and they pull together. Right. Right. You have to provide a certain amount of personnel to uh, if you're going to benefit from what they offer, you have to have people attack. There used to be a Quincy Underwater Recovery Team, which is a very active for probably 25, 30 years. I don't know where it is now, what it's doing now, but um, it was a all volunteer type operation that would got involved in the recovery, as you say. Whenever there was a uh, situation, it was non-law enforcement, but they're all volunteers used to get involved. Is that still is that still alive and available? Not that I'm aware of. No. Kathy. Kathy, John, you a fishing lane. Who has the ultimate authority on the water? The Coast Guard. You. If this, if this, this, this obviously it has to be a hierarchy, as, as uh, Howie was saying, and we see all three boats racing out to help with an emergency. Who's the person? Who's the entity that has the power to say? Um, I'm in charge. I think outside the harbor, the Coast Guard for sure. Coast Guard, yeah. okay. So inside the harbor, you can police and they can monitor. But outside the harbor, it's the Coast Guard that's in charge. We, we default to them because they're more experienced. Right, well, they've been I mean? here for years and years and years, so they always had their coverage. Okay, right. that's what I think a lot of us are trying to figure out how the pieces fit together. Um, and it's certainly admirable the training, but when we see three boats race out of the harbor, we don't know who's who's doing what, and it's it's a little confusing. I have a feeling when you see three boats racing out of the harbor, the people driving them don't know what they got yet. You know, I think that was a mayday call that turned out to be smoke on the vessel. Well, a lot of times all the boats go up because we all know when all the boats are rocking. We don't know who's going to get there first, but they're all going up. Yeah. Okay, so Coast Guard's the top. You're next, and then the harbor master. I mean, I hate to stack them up like that. You know? Well, yeah, but I guess that's what. Can I, can I just you know, interject a little bit too? I think it's, it's very situational. Okay. So it depends on what incident you have out there. 
Yeah. So there are things out of the water that, yes, the Coast Guard is going to be the lead. They're out of the water. They're outside of the harbor. Yeah. And what they can do and the type of things that they can do are different than what we can do. They're okay. operating under federal guidelines. Yeah. If there winds up being an OUI that's out there, if there yeah. winds up being a domestic that's out there, yeah. somebody out there has got a warrant to come across. Yeah. If it's anything that you could come across on the land, yeah. we're going to wind up being the ones taking that. Okay. Um, because that's what we do. Yeah. So anything that can happen on the land can very easily happen on the water. So domestic happens on the boat all the time. The husband and wife don't get along together. Well, that's just boating. <laughs> <laughs> so there we go. It's <laughs> Right, so, so, so that's my point. Is just because they're on the water now doesn't change the fact that we're still within the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. Certainly, if you go outside of that and our jurisdiction ends, that's going to be different. And there are definitely will things that we'll defer to the Coast Guard on. Um, but I think it really depends on you know what is the situation that's being you know that we're responding to, and that's probably going to dictate then who wants to take the lead on that. Would you say that on any given day with a million dollars of war that you are involved in one, two, several law enforcement issues? I'll let Officer McCall answer that, so I think you can... They better define law enforcement issues. Well, something that the Harbor Master wouldn't be able to handle, something that the Coast Guard wouldn't be able to handle, something that is specifically a police map. Well, police, so the, the harbor master can, there are laws that he can enforce, the Coast Guard can enforce laws. So a police map, I don't know if that's the right terminology for it. We're, we go up there, we conduct vessel stop, safety inspections, looking for our I, 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 People are trying to understand what you do specifically right, that the harbor master and the Coast Guard couldn't do. What? Why are you not superfluous? So the we're out there as a, as a law enforcement part of the system. Right. right. So our jurisdictional boundaries are touching a little to clarify a little bit. So we we are situated water flow three miles offshore um, because we have a marine unit in, in the guidelines of the state. We go to our our rest hours and our jurisdictional boundaries go twelve miles offshore. So go to our northernmost border, southernmost border, twelve miles offshore. That's where we can operate in, 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 in that kind of mission. Uh, while we're out there, we're doing vessel stops. So we're going to let vessel stops, safety inspections. Things of that is looking for compared to others. The harbor master can do that 100%. It's within their rights. They can enforce chapter 98, which is anything that happens out there, chapter 98. If we run into an impaired driver, that is, uh, somebody that's operating under the influence, or there's narcotics on board, or things of that nature, that becomes us. They can't enforce that. They don't have training. That becomes law enforcement. What a lot of it is is underage. That's what I get. I want these guys tagged. The boats are showing up to the spit, but there's about four inches over the waterline because they get 13 kids on a 13 foot spit. Okay? I want them off that boat. I want them reunited with parents. I want them some support if we have to go to repeat kids. And as Stephen had mentioned, one of those stories, that's exactly what happened earlier in the summer. And, you know, is, that, is that the majority of I mean, it's helpful. Is that your major caseload no, the spit? That's what I want to work in the most on, yeah. Okay. I mean, can I, I give you one other scenario too, which I think you're going to see every weekend at the spit. Mm -hmm. So, anybody who's been to the spit probably knows there are a lot of people there, right? And they're not all from Sitchwick. They're coming down from the North Shore, from Town of Cape, from Plymouth, wherever. You see boats from all over the place. Well, you happen to be the, the person who came in today from the North Shore somewhere, and there's some interaction that occurs. Well, from a law enforcement standpoint, when we're going to go and have an interaction with them, we don't know who this person is. And the interaction we're having with you today from the North Shore might be that you don't like police officers, you don't like law enforcement, and maybe you've got a couple of warrants on you. So we have an ability to now, when we're having our interaction, just like when you get stopped on the road for speeding, we're going to take your license, take your information, and we can run you through our computer and find out if you've got some warrants. Maybe you don't like law enforcement. Maybe you've had future interactions before we were combative. Maybe there are other threats. We get things that pop up on our little computer screen when we stop them in the car that says, Caution, this person is bad because X, Y, Z. So those are things that we want to know before we have an interaction with you on the street. Because I might just be coming over because you don't have enough life preservers. Or maybe I'm a little bit worried you don't have too many people on the boat. You don't know why I'm coming over. And you say, well, you know what, I don't know why it comes over, but I don't care. Fight's on. I got warrants, I'm not going with them, whatever. 
So those interactions can happen because, as you know, it's not every mother and father and a couple of kids are going to spit. And those are the things that we want to be careful for. And we want to make sure that the spit is, I'm just using spit as one example, but people who have gone by that know, wow, there are a lot of people there. There are things going on there that maybe aren't safe. We want to be able to have those interactions and let people know, you know, they should be a safe place for people to go. You should be able to come up here with your boat, do your thing, enjoy your family time, have fun. We're not trying to interrupt that, but we want to make sure that people are, who are coming there that maybe don't necessarily always do the right thing, that we're able to, to deal with them appropriately so that it will be safe and fun for everybody. So does that mean that this, during an eight-hour day you spend most of your time with the spit? I think it depends on the on what the day is and what the demand is. I think you say for being out there, the majority of the time, we we focus first there. Okay. Go on the road, we check there. You like my my let's see Monday. Monday was a beautiful morning day. This is the boat that was a great one, a great day to end the season for mm -hmm. I don't know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> don't say that. <laughs> Yes. So we went over there. I actually had uh, spoke to the caution from Station City uh, earlier in the morning. He said we're underway. Uh, we're only going to be out there until about one or two o'clock, uh, and then we're going to be we're going to be heading back. So I said, yep, we're going to be out there about noon time, and uh, we're going to be out there until six, seven, eight o'clock that night. I don't know. Uh, and he he called me and said the river there's a lot of boats over there. So we spent the majority of our time in the North and South River. And then uh, uh, off of Hummer Rock. And then and then we did take an area, I mean, we had a lot of water. We had Bassin's Beach up in Colasset. I mean, that's like a whole other spit out there. And then we have the deep hole over Marshfield. Like, there's a lot of other areas in just the beach. But we've had a lot of problems there. We've had a lot of complaints from residents, from voters, um, and conservation uh, coming from the spit. So we give it a lot of attention. And if we, if we deem it like we did Monday, that we should be in this, in this water longer. Then that's that's where we'll set. Thank you. I, thanks for clarifying. Just one follow up on that was uh, in years past, Joe Noble, the harbormaster, always had a boat in the North River, uh, right between the entrance of the South River and the Spit, and I think that controls the situation. It was visible. It was always there, and you knew to slow down. And um, we don't have that now, and I think that would aid everybody by having a, someone there every weekend. It, people would know you're going to be there. Um, so I think that for the hobby master to have a boat there, like it had been in the past, would be super. Yeah, yeah. This, was, this was right at the entrance, right at the split, but no, it was not very long. Anchored eight hours a day. <clears throat> Any other questions? Yeah. You mentioned the harbor master has the same authority as you guys on the water. Harbor Master has Chapter 90B. Okay. Our, our authority doesn't. So he comes, one of their people comes across somebody, can you just describe, that doesn't like police or authority figures. And he's got young kids running the boat. Hopefully those kids have the brains then to be able to figure out something real quick before the uh, situation escalates. They don't know, and you don't know, what those people have in that boat, right. as far as weapons, whatever. Every boat's probably got at least one weapon, right? Yeah. A nine, whatever. A flare. Yeah. I didn't get shot with flare. Yeah. I mean, when the Coast Guard boards a boat, the first question they ask is, is there any weapons on that boat? Mm -hmm. They want to know all the weapons are on it, and where they are. You know, just like you guys probably. Now, to me, if they're, you're giving them the authority to do stuff like that, that seems dangerous for them. <coughs> I think one of the things you've seen is the same thing when we stop somebody. If we're going to run your license plate, probably before yeah. we get out of the car, or before we can start the car, we can do the same thing with the MS number on the boat. Yeah. So we'll know who owns the boat, we can run that person. Um, so the, the technology that we have access to is... Yeah. The technology to run the um, document numbers? We do. You do. Peter, do you have something? Well, well, this has been very helpful because it's been having been on my mooring for you know 30 years and half the time never going out of the harbor, just listening to the radio or watching the traffic go by. Some days lately it seems like there can be more traffic of Coast Guard and Harbor Master and 
you folks and the environmental police than regular voters out there. But um, so this is very helpful just to get a better understanding of whose roles and so forth. Uh, and I think more of that would be helpful for the optics of somebody like me who's been there for many years. And my wife says, "Is that a harbor master boat?" You know, what you guys go on. No, I think so. I don't know. And then it, you know, you hear in the radio, geez, we're. It's unit five, I think, is what you're up to now, where it used to be three That's units. the pump out one. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> uh, very good. I thought that was going to that, 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 that explains that. Uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, <laughs> no, anyway, that's all. This has been very helpful. I think more of that assisting folks understand it, because you're, you're talking to a lot of experienced voters who were scratching their heads. And, you know, I think in the long run, you know community policing out there when you're going to split the spit as well. That's because you're dealing with the youth. That's probably a good thing. I think we discussed about two critical things. One is the community policing. And I think from the inception, particularly year one, that's what we wanted to do. We wanted to go ahead and introduce ourselves and just be a presence there as opposed to some type of an enforcement mechanism, really. Right. But uh, communication is something I think that we've identified that we could have done a better job throughout this. Um, you'll be seeing Officer McCauley quite frequently at these meetings now. Um, and as the Chief has mentioned though too, our doors are always open and our phones are always available, our emails are always available. So if you see something or, you know, everybody's always around. Um, so we'd rather hear from people so that we can actually get answers out there, get the correct, correct responses out there, so people know what we're doing and what we're trying to accomplish. Um, and we'd like to hear the things that we're doing well and the things that we're not doing well. Um, so we need to address that. Anyone else? I think it's been really helpful. Appreciate you guys coming down tonight. And uh, Anytime. like to have you down maybe in the future again. Yeah. Thanks very much. Thank you. 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 Okay, um, any new business? Um, Steve, I just Steve, I have a, a follow-up question, if I may, on the, uh, the ending of the moorings. How did you find out it's, it's sort of a, um, an audit operation? How, how did you find out were there a lot of missing moorings? Did you find moorings that weren't we're, registered? We're still working on that end of it, uh, because most of the numbers were there, but in uh, certain areas, there were still numbers that were missing. Uh, so up in the rivers was uh, somewhat challenging. Mm -hmm. We were trying, and even in the harbor, not all of them were there, so we're trying to cross MS numbers or, you know, you know they have their sticker like they're supposed to cross that over to the area. Mm -hmm. Okay. Yeah, I'm just curious. I, I sorry. It's this, just something. Um, I thought it would be, I, I think it's a worthwhile, yeah. you know, to audit, see what you have. I mean, the band on my morning, you know, sorry, I'm like, oh, interesting. <laughs> it's good. But yeah, no, I was just curious if, if you found a lot of missing ones or found people that weren't paid. It, or it pops up the missing ones, and it also pops up the ones that you know may not necessarily necessarily belong. Mm -hmm. yeah. It just gives you an idea, you know, checks and balances. Yep, good. Right. I'd be curious to see kind of once you finish the exercise what you found. Yeah. So. Yeah. Do you know how many you found in the South and North River? That um, I, I have a list. Um, the ones that didn't have any numbers and didn't have any bowling on it, we didn't get. Because there was no way to, you know, it would be just putting a band on something. So, like this. Was so quite a few thumbs up there. Yeah, so it was a fair amount. Anybody else? Well, we did. Um, one other thing, we also sent out the. Um, Mooring renewal uh, on August 1st, um, and we, you know, with the five dollar charge, um, that went out August 1st, and they've been being returned. Some of them we have bad addresses, so we have to chase them down. Mm -hmm. Old business. Um, Dredging, dredging update. Do we do we know? How Freddie went to the meeting. Yeah, no easements. I went to the easement meeting, and like I said, it was mixed. Um, there was a meeting in Plymouth that I didn't get to go. Did you? I, I went to see it, and um, 
the state realizes how much how important dredging is and how important keeping what they call the maritime highways open. Uh, but the amount of funding it's going to take to do all the dredging projects and to get them all done would cripple the, the state budget for 10 years. <laughs> What's the status of our um, permits? For the dredging? Yeah. They're, we're still working on Green, I know more, or I've heard more about green size analysis, sand. <laughs> I'm not quite sure why, <laughs> what the importance of it is, but I hear about it an awful lot. And uh, that's been going back and forth to, Mass, uh, to UMass Boston, to the Air Force, and to this agency, and to that, you know, just all the different agencies looking at these, the green size. Well, according to the um, Nancy Durfee's group, I guess the, it's acceptable material. For the doom, so for the doom, yeah. but they were talking more at, uh, trying to do something either on Hammer Rock if they get the easements, if not Hammer Rock, and then at Fourth, fourth Cliff for the airfields. And it's, it's the easements, yep. How was, how was the presentation for that? Oh, uh, the easements and that. It was, it was more of a, um, a request to produce the easements as opposed to an information meeting. Uh, a lot of the information that people are looking for won't be available until March with the engineering work. Um, this is more of an emotional meeting, I think, to, for people to let go of their, their property. Um, but they didn't have all the answers and they won't have them until March, according to the, uh, the group that was there. Still a lot of questions as to how it's going to work out. I think it's something we should look at as a group. I think we should get a copy of the plans that they plan on doing on the roadside and on the, the shore side or the other side with the new dune. And we should actually look at it and maybe get some input into it and have our thoughts put into it. You know, I think I'm maybe, not 100% sure I'm beyond the whole thing, so I don't well, know. Well, there, there's, probably, there's some alternatives. I know Marshfield has looked at alternatives to dispose of dredge spoils. Rexham Beach. Rexham Beach, even up to and including selling it on the market, you know, as you felt. So I mean, we should look into all that and probably get a little bit more involved with Marshfield and what they've done. I guess I'm talking about a different thing. I'm not about talking about the dredge. I'm talking about the dune that they're um, proposing to put out. Oh, to build the dune. Yeah, and then to redo the road. I, and again, I think we should get the whole plans and as a group look at them. Um, I, I think the road's a great idea. And That's to raise it up. Correct, so that the water can't come back in from the other side. But I'm not convinced the dune is the best plan. And I know it's already been I've spent $580,000, I think, on, on engineering. But I, I just think as waterways, this is like something we should look at. Yeah, I asked what site we're talking about. Amrock. Amrock. The outside of Amrock, what they're proposing is they're going to build a dune and they're going to try to shallow it out so as the waves come in their head. But this dune is going to be approximately four feet higher than the people's patios. So not, not only do they lose their view, which is no big deal, I guess, if you're gonna keep your house, but the dune is gonna be made out of 80% cobble and 20% sand. So I think we all know what lighthouse looks like after every storm. So I, I just think that the, the cobble is just gonna be taken and just thrown into the houses if we have a storm. I, and, and I could be totally wrong, and I think maybe we should bring Nancy in, but I just think as waterways, it's something we should look at, it just shouldn't go through without any input at all. Thank you. <coughs> just a How? follow up on Keith's comment. I would like to see this commission's battle cry be safety. We have a safety issue getting into the South River. We got about where they're gonna put the cobbles, the crane size, the height, easements, I think this commission would be, be focused on voter safety because it's, it's a safety issue right now. At the time. It's been a safety issue down there, but there's been more concern for whatever reason about granular size and this and that, and where we're going to put it. At some point in time, there'd be no South River entrance anymore. It's Precisely. Be. So as Mr. Bellow says, I mean, if this commission did nothing else, you know, to be talking about we believe as a team we've got a safety issue there. I did bring it up and I did ask that question. And I was told that 
I told them, whenever I go in and it's low tide, we hit, and they said, well, you're not in the channel. We moved the markers and everything should be fine now. That's what they told me. Don't worry. I, I know, I know, but that's what I was told. They need 100% acceptance on the, on the easements, which I don't think they'll get 50% because I know the majority of the people down there. They, there's no, they, we don't know what's gonna, what they got to make the sand dune out of. You got to put some aggregate in it, some rock in there, and I'll try to hold the place. We've seen the sacrificial dune di disappear in a month. This here also, the town has to tell us whether they're going to maintain it, how much they're going to maintain it, and the, uh, they want us to sign the easement before we get the money. Now, the people in the town of Citroën, they're paying for the, the library, Pier 44, the high school, the new police station, and, and there's one of the grade schools needs a lot of work. I don't think the people want to add the due to their tax rate. It, on top of that, Don, one thing that was mentioned is if there was not sufficient material coming from the dredging of the South River, and the easements were signed and the agreement was made, the town would have to go out and purchase the material to make the doom. And I think that by itself is a, a whole new game by its, it, it's just opening another can of worms. A big chunk of that money's coming in from grants, but not all of it. Uh, on the dredging, they are, they're threatening, if we don't sign the easements, they'll take the spoils, there's another part of Citroën, but, we did, we did the dredging 10 years ago, whatever it was. We took a near shore dumping. It helps because it makes, the, it makes it shallower and it takes the energy out of the waves, plus it nourishes the beach. But they don't want any part of that. They're threatening us. If we don't sign the easements, they'll take the spoil someplace else. Yeah. Go ahead. For years, they've been taking it down to this, the state dumping grounds, which is up a well fleet down there, which is the most ridiculous thing in the world. The fuel, the energy that's going into taking it down there and then bringing it back, the dump back in the barge, it's insane. We're being led by some of the people. The, the, uh, and also, talk about the river, South River. Is it old news, new news, or no news? <laughs> and they've done the engineering, haven't they? I thought I had seen the engineer boat out there. Is anybody got a uh, chat, plot plan of what's going to be dredged and what's not going to be dredged? I, you know, they, I've been told that they're not going to dredge the mouth of the river. It's probably mostly in the straightaway, and then there's a, a little bit up there, but. I'm kind of curious what's going on with the dredging. I think I think the target area was the, the channel coming in by Trellance Island was the um, from the NR buoy, the number nine of the NR up up past Trellance Island was where they were going to target. Um, and I honestly, after that, I'm not sure how much money they had to dredge anything more. They did do a survey of the whole river, and there were some spots that were high, but that. Uh, like from the NR in number nine up by Trellis was the was the worst spot. The priority area, I think, is what they call the area. Yeah. yeah. Was that which which was the dangerous area? Gary, mm -hmm. um, it's too late this year, but to the harbor master, you might be in contact with the Coast Guard and have them get a buoy tender in here and. Get the buoys painted because they're looking really crappy. <laughs> yeah. I spent two years every year in Alaska in miserable weather replacing those things. But, you know, it needs to be done. And two, it plays on your harbor. People come in and see it. They were nice and painted. It adds something to the harbor. Yeah. Yeah. Ed Larry, one on nine country. Uh, I've got two points of information. I, I'm, I'm curious of. Number one, 
Mr. Mullen, is your operating budget totally from the enterprising fund or are there, uh, are there town funding? There is no town funding that comes into the Hartmaster's office. Everything, salaries, uh, all the expenses, anything we do in that office or in this harbor is out of the enterprise funds. I was thinking about, I was struck by a couple of comments, several comments tonight. Number one was your comment that there were over 2,000 boats in, in, in the harbor. And uh, that's, a, a, that's a, approximate, an approximate, approximate which yeah. to me just and if you, is millions of dollars there's a, worth of real There's about property. 400 between the two marinas. There's another five or 500 plus on moorings, and then you have your other marinas. So, and I, I heard Phyllis's comment about a, a boat that was sick, a couple of boats that have sunk, and then another comment about uh, the property loss at this time of the season. And, and, and your comment about the 24-hour uh, patrols we used to have in this harbor. I'm just curious, what what was the decision? that was made where we have this resource, this, this property, that we decided that, that we're not going to protect from 11 o'clock until 8 o'clock in the morning. I wasn't here 15 years ago. Uh, I, I, and and I'm, not, I'm not saying that, what, but you are here now. Is, is that part of your It's not part of my budget. Plan to no, it's not in the budget. It's not aligned. OK, so it wouldn't fit in the budget funds that you're right. available. Okay. I mean, I have to be added to the budget. Yeah. I can speak to it because uh, I, I uh, participated in it. They used to have one person patrol and they had one person in the office. And mm -hmm. it was terrible duty to do. Um, I can't remember if it was it 10 or 15 years ago, but they got rid of it. I mean, uh, he's, doing, he's doing the best he can with the budget that well, he has. I was just curious if you were operating under restriction. That, that's well, I don't think right. it's to the lack of desire. I mean, we've also talked okay. about making they, suggestions to adjust that maybe they start earlier. And, and, uh, but I don't know that, uh, again, you get to the point where if you have one person, we're talking about one person patrolling. If you had one person patrolling and they're in the river and something happens in the harbor, it, it, you, I mean, it's trying to predict but, where. But, but, but the police also made points if your presence, if, if, if you make your presence visible, then that has a deterrent effect. I, I, I just want, that was just an informational thing. The second thing, I, I, I'm sorry, I know it's late, but I, I'm looking at the, 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 the sort of way in which this committee is composed here, and I would like to make a suggestion that the committee consider seeking uh, to include members from the Yacht Club, the Boat Club, and the marinas, because I think that they are major stakeholders in this harbor. And I think that it, seeking input from, about the, from those particular institu institutions would, I think, just add to the conversation. Also, it's a two-way street. Any information that goes on in this conversation can therefore go back to the yacht club, to the boat club, to the marinas, so that the, the whole community becomes I think uh, uh, more informed of all what's going on. So uh, I don't know if you if that's something that you folks want to commit. Uh, to yeah, we don't. I, I think you um, submit your application to be on the board. We don't. You don't do any. We don't outreach? do any of that. You don't do any outreach. I've done some outreach to the commercial fishermen, mm -hmm. and they were. I mean, I've spoken to some people and said you should, you know, put your name in to get on waterways, but... Because of the nature of the way the commission is made up and the number of people, they were told at town hall, fishermen I spoke to, that there's only one time a year when you can put your name in, basically, and at the time they were, they were offering, there was not an available opening. So it's a long-term thing. We really would love to have people from the Yacht Club. Uh, we have Steve Dodd. He's an associate. He comes in. Um, Dave Friedman. Dave, Dave Friedman's in there. Yeah. Dave, yeah. Dave Francis. Yeah. Francis. Yeah. Brian, uh, Brian yeah. Kelly. Yeah. They have three yeah. people from the. We've got three people from the. I didn't know. That I, did, I didn't know if it was a formal or an informal yeah. situation. No, it's formal. So you should look at people who want to be members of the Waterways Commission. Fill out a form. Send it to the selectmen. And the selectmen make choices. There are those of us who are on the board for 12 years that were eliminated 
because we've been on the board for 12 years. Is there a Even limit? We've been on the board for 12 years. So I'll have the numbers. Six we, basically, if you want to have people go on to waterways, you fill out a form, you send it to the board of selectmen and say, I want to be on waterways. And then from there on, they make the decision. Thank you. Captain. Friend, I think one of the Charlie Costello's, one of his uh, points that he made in his um, in his report to you was he felt that it was important for the harbor master's office to get out and communicate with all the entities in the harbor. They felt that there was, because it's a, basically a lot of it is PR, that it's important for your, for you to be, uh, and, and I think he's and we have we have been. Right, and I think maybe that would be uh, part of your report by your monthly meetings would be how you've, um, what you've done. I think they suggested going out and having meetings with the different, the, the boat club, yacht club, and marinas. Maybe that's the way to work on it and then find out when you're ready to do your budget for next year, what might work that you may reposition your staffing and working with them that would come out better. You know. I mean, I reached out several times to, just, that's to the Charlie boat club said, and the so. yacht club right. and to a lot of the entities and I went to a lot of the businesses. Right. And I got very, I don't think I really got any response. I mean, well, I, I actually... He felt it was very important that you do it, and I think... No, I did do it. I, I sent <laughs> letters out, and yeah. I, I actually physically went to these locations yeah. and, and, you know, reached out to people yeah. to try to set up a meeting to sit down right. Steve, and talk to them about any issues they have with... Steve visited my Miranda uh, last week. Yeah. Well, maybe it's going to the council meetings or something, but I thought it was a very good point that Charlie made that would, um, you know, I think we realize we're just trying to work on relationships between the police, the Coast Guard, waterways, and all the entities in town. As Ed said, there's an awful lot of commerce involved in this. So maybe just following up on that. Maybe if we um, have anyone here who's at the Yacht Club, the Boat Club, they want to bring that up at a meeting when they get the next meeting, see if we can get a liaison or someone who would like to come in and or have, or have Steve one. come to the council meeting, so the other uh, meetings, of, you know, that might be good. Sure. Yeah. Okay. I mean, yeah, at one point, at the other part of the club, at one point, we, we did have Mark Patterson come, I think on two different occasions where uh, he was on the agenda to speak about different harbor plans. One was the dredging, that's how long ago that was. How many years ago was he the master? <laughs> and another time was, um, with the mooring plan, and they had the original mooring plan that never really took off. And it, yeah, I, I did see Steve in the parking lot. The I've come over and I've talked to the boat club over. about pilings. Yeah. I've <coughs> talked to him about you know different things. I think um, the yacht club's talking about doing pilings now. Is that correct or? It's on the table. Very sure. I, I went to the Lobstermen's Association, um, well, TK O'Malley's. <laughs> I can't make people like me. <laughs> yeah. So, so just to go off on that, it sounds like you would welcome a liaison from the boat club, an official liaison who was an ad hoc member, not a voting, not an associate, but perhaps a call whatever you would, but somebody that represented the club rather than having Steve or someone from the Waterways Commission trying to go to those clubs meetings. I think reaching yeah, out yeah, from the Harbor Master's yeah. office is a great idea, but if we got interest at the clubs where they could send a person yeah. with information and needs, whatever, from the clubs, that would help us also. That would help them. Yeah. Sure. That would, that would be good for us. Okay. Okay. Keith. Back to Ed. Sorry, I didn't mean to wake up back there. But I, <laughs> um, I, I kind of like your idea, and I know it's more money coming out of the Enterprise Fund, but maybe we can do it. We need to study it first and find out, and God, I just said that, but um, we need to figure out if it's if it's something that's worth doing, but we must have incidents out here in the middle of the night. It's kind of like the second ambulance was supposed to have. The joke around town is don't have your heart attack at night because we only have one ambulance. Yeah, It's the same scenario. There must be yes. stuff that happens out here at night. There is, and, so, and eventually at some point, someone will have a medical emergency. Yeah, and then night. something will happen and we'll be... Unless there's someone on a nearby boat that can get them into right. or Maybe we work the police boat into it somehow. So yeah. I mean, fire watch and, and, yeah, I mean, I, I agree, uh, Keith, you know, with just a fire watch or a uh, looking out for medical or... Uh, yeah. 
I mean, I, I don't know what the cost is. I don't know what the, the incident rate is or what's going on, but I don't think it's something we should just sweep aside and say it certainly it's would not be like a, It should be, should certainly would be a minor theft deterrent to mm -hmm. not know for kids to know that there was a patrol going out there, but they wouldn't know exactly where or when. It may, may satisfy one other issue too, which is the access to the rooms. Right. Um, yeah. 24 hours, you might be able to accommodate that better. Mm -hmm. um, with that for the, you know, May, June, July, August, right. September. So I'd like to propose we like put it on some agendas going forward and figure out what we need to do. Mm -hmm. Obviously we couldn't do it for this year because the budgets right. are all already in, but I mean, next season, something we could probably look at. Mm -hmm. Anyone else? Motion? <clears throat> Make a motion to adjourn? Motion to adjourn. I uh, can concur. Motion second. Thank you. Thank you very much for coming, folks.